My name is Rory Medcalf. I'm the head of the National Security College here at the Australian National University. I should say here virtually, of course. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to host uh, a really uh, not only distinguished, but I think dynamic panel that you're going to listen to and engage with over the next 90 minutes. Our topic, of course, is India's future, um, the shape and character of India's future, uh, India as India, India and the world, India in the Indo-Pacific, and of course, India's relations with, with Australia. And in a moment, I'll introduce our panel to you. Before I begin, um, as is customary, I'll acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are uh, recording from here in Canberra today, uh, the Ngunnawal people, and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So the discussion that we have uh, for you, as I said, is going to be looking in a very wide ranging way at India's future. And we'll certainly get to some pretty sharp questions, I hope, on what uh, India's trajectory means for Australia and for Australia's interests. To discuss this topic and really, I hope, contest ideas, uh, we have three speakers who, between them, I think, encompass uh, a breadth of experience and expertise on India. We have uh, two uh, Indian experts, two, um, I won't necessarily say young or emerging because they're already very high impact voices in India's policy debate. We have uh, Ritika Pasi, who is with the Observer Research Foundation, uh, arguably uh, India's uh, most influential uh, and um, effective think tank, certainly India's um, largest, uh, I think, and most established uh, think tank across foreign and security policy. And I note that Ritika also has an affiliation this year with the Perth US Asia Centre. Uh, in Western Australia as a, uh, an Indo-Pacific fellow. We have uh, Dr. Constantino Xavier, who, and Constantino is uh, with, uh, he's with the Brookings Institution, but within India, he's with the, uh, the Centre for Social and Economic Pro Progress, uh, which I understand is the, uh, ha has a relationship with the uh, Brookings India, or what was the Brookings India initiative, uh, but now stands very much on its own feet. And Constantino has had a lot of impact across the debate, not only on Indian foreign policy, but on the perspectives of new generations of Indian thinkers. And we have Harinder Sidhu. Um, I, I guess it would be traditional uh, in some countries to call Harinder uh, High Commissioner Sidhu, because although she's not uh, serving head of mission at the moment, um, Harinder was the Australian High Commissioner to New Delhi uh, quite recently, I think before our current High Commissioner, Barry O'Farrell, and therefore had a key role, I think, in the strengthening of the Australia-India relationship. Uh, Harinder, of course, has a, uh, a, a distinguished career across the Australian public service and is now Deputy Secretary in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and uh, Chief Operating Officer there. So we've got three great speakers for you. And what I want to do before I go to discussion among our panel and certainly questions and engagement from the participants is put a couple of framing questions to each of you. Now, as I've said, we want to range pretty widely. So we certainly want to look at India as a foreign policy actor, and we want to look at India as a, a power in the Indo-Pacific and globally. Um, Ritika, going to you first, if I may, um, it would be great to hear from you and, and in due course from Constantino as well, what I would call uh, a next generation question um, or a next generation sense uh, or sensibility about really India's role in its world, in the world, India's strategic vision, um, its role and its interests as a power in the, uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And I'd especially be interested in your views on what should India's priorities and ambitions be in this region. Um, thank you, Professor Metcalf. Uh, good morning from Delhi. Uh, this is my first interaction uh, with uh, ACLF. Thank you to Richard for the kind invitation. And I'm delighted to be participating today in the excellent company of my co-panelists and moderator. I think you'd be hard pressed to find um, uh, an Indian today that isn't 
more confident about its promise and potential on the global stage, particularly in the context of Indo-Pacific. And I'd like to address the opening questions in, um, by, uh, by, by elaborating on what I see are uh, the roles that India is seeking to play in the, mid to short, in the short to mid run in the Indo-Pacific. I see it positioning itself in a couple of ways, and these are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they will be and are being played concurrently across different areas of engagement. Uh, the first role that I see India playing is um, based on its status as a middle power and its need to, to balance China given growing differences. I think uh, last year, of course, was a watershed moment in India-China ties. And this uh, points to a greater trend line towards uh, engaging with the West, with the US and its allies, certainly, as it seeks to compensate um, for its own deficits at present through partnerships and external balancing. But I think it's important to point out that um, presently that the objective of this balancing is towards a multipolar Indo-Pacific um, as middle players like India rise and pursue agency. India's bilaterals across the Indo-Pacific, whether it is with the Gulf countries, UAE, for example, or with ASEAN, or um, uh, with the major powers, uh, or, or with US, or of course the Quad and Quad countries, but also it's intensifying minilateral and plurilateral engagement, I think is proof positive of this pursuit for a networked multipolar space in the, uh, in the, in the Indo-Pacific. And therefore we have a JAI or an India, Australia, France, but we also have an India, Australia, Indonesia, the Quad of course, but also the SEO, which assumes greater importance now in the wake of Afghanistan and sub-regional configurations such as the, uh, the Colombo security dispensation, which brings together India and its Indian Ocean neighbors. The key objective, call it strategic autonomy, but I think a better way to think about it is uh, an opportunity for India to increase its maneuvering space and its foreign policy to ensure a multipolar Asia, a free, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific, both of which will allow India maximum options for growth, development, security at home. I think the second role um, that India is seeking to play is in service of its ambition to be a leading power, to be a rule setter. And I think we have seen um, India playing a greater uh, uh, role in terms of providing regional public goods, but also as a convener. Um, for example, it's HADR um, uh, in the space of HADR, whether in terms of India's naval capacities, strengthening naval capacities, or in terms of it leading the platform, uh, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, um, whether it is in the space of connectivity, specifically infrastructure diplomacy. And I'd argue that even as India does not have a globe spanning connectivity vision akin to uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative or now the G7's uh, Build Back Better World proposal, that India still has a solid frame for um, increasing a regional infrastructure diplomacy. Um, and of course, it's, it's, it's steadily increasing a development assistance program and development partnership. Um, I think it's also interesting to note here that it's seeking to actively co-opt a broader range of countries to participate in emerging governance architecture in the Indo-Pacific. And here I'd like to um, call out or uh, uh, bring to attention the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative. Uh, it cuts across seven pillars from maritime security to maritime biodiversity to transport and infrastructure. Uh, Japan uh, and Australia have uh, uh, indicated, have signed on to uh, the IPOI and it remains to be seen what shape it takes uh, uh, going forward. But I think India's um, intellectual leadership would be hard to dismiss in the space of the, the Indo-Pacific. I think it's also critical to note, however, that India is able to play this role as uh, being able to provide regional public goods uh, because of its successes and experiences at home. So it is able to, with France, platform the International Solar Alliance because of its own success in deploying solar uh, energy at home. And this, I think I'd like to briefly um, now just end with one obvious, I think, uh, point that needs to be said here. Uh, that relates to this exact point of its success and development at home is that there is a concern um, which I think would uh, which, which should not be sidelined that 
as India strives to play a balancing role in the pursuit of a multipolar Asia and Indo-Pacific, that as India pursues its leadership ambitions in this Indo-Pacific and its immediate Indian Ocean and broader Indo-Pacific region, that it runs the risk of also being an absent power in some respects. And here I think India's track record with respect to developing um, trade and investment ties uh, is witness or is testament to this uh, huge gap uh, and therefore the role that it can play in shaping the economic infrastructure of Indo-Pacific, which is going to be an increasingly important component of, of course, um, uh, realizing the potential of the, the space that India inhabits. I think COVID-19 has only brought these challenges to the fore, but it has to be stated that these gaps in India's growth and development existed before COVID. And therefore, it now depends on um, whether a flurry of Indian initiatives that have been, uh, that, that we now talk about, whether it's Atmanirbhar or the National Infrastructure Pipeline, um, or now uh, India's, uh, India's engagement in um, in trying to uh, um, uh, uh, trying to achieve mini FTAs with a number of countries, how well it fares here in order to build its material, human, economic, military capacity, in order to be able to play the two roles that I've mapped out before. There's a lot there, thank you, and I think that already brings some of our audience perhaps out of a familiar zone where we don't necessarily think of India as a provider of public goods in the region. I would um, challenge you on one point there to begin with though, and that is, you know, we, we, we've seen what a dreadful uh, impact uh, the pandemic had in India this year, particularly in those awful months in sort of April, May, June, where the Delta variant was really at its height as far as we could see in India. And um, I guess many of us would say, well, has that thrown India off course with this more ambitious, ambitious regional agenda? Um, how is that going from your perspective? Um, as I've mentioned, uh, COVID-19 has definitely brought to the fore glaring gaps, uh, whether it's in terms of um, uh, it's the, the uh, dependence on inf an informal economy, whether it is um, the gaps in social and uh, um, digital infrastructure in India. Um, but I think that like for many uh, countries in across the world, COVID-19 definitely delays India's aspirations, but I began with saying that I think that India has a level of confidence that perhaps hasn't been, been witnessed up till now. And I think there is a, at least there is a drive to, um, to have the inputs in place. What those inputs manifest into, what outcomes these inputs manifest into, whether it's in terms of uh, expressing a desire in wanting to change labor, to codify India's various labor laws into for specific, to streamline them, for example, or this recognition of needing to um, to deliver better, to deliver faster. Uh, while this recognition exists, I think now with COVID, with the increasing tensions with China, this is actually India's window of opportunity to prove to itself, but also to its neighborhood and its partners that it can be a reliable um, partner and power in the, in the Indo-Pacific. And I would actually turn this around, maybe it is because I'm a little bit of an optimist, but I would like to, to, to say that I believe that this could be a real opportunity if India does get its, in, its domestic act together. And if it does focus on the long-term consequences of its actions today, instead of short-term electoral gains, for instance. Thank you, that's, that's fantastic, uh, really sets the scene. And I'm going to build on that with uh, Constantino, um, a couple of questions for you and, you know, feel free to agree or disagree with your um, with your co-panelists. Um, you know, I think one of the uh, one of the, the joys of um, policy engagement with India is, um, is 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 that argument is built into the conversation. So that's what democracy sounds like. But but I want to ask you, Constantino, about about democracy actually. Uh, you know, about the character of Indian society, uh, India's political system, Indian democracy, uh, and 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 how that plays into. 
the expectations that many of us are now placing on India's greater role in the region and the world. And, and you know, it's no surprise or secret that uh, some friends of India watching uh, India over the past few years are asking questions about the character of Indian democracy, uh, about whether there's growing liberalism, what that means for India as a power in the world. So it'd be useful if you could connect some of those threads for us. I mean, how do you see the, uh, the landscape of the nature of India's political system changing or not? And how does that play to India's role in the Indo-Pacific? And I guess just to, to frame all of that, you know, a lot of us would look at the, the China balancing role that India and many countries are playing. Um, also ask ourselves, uh, is this balancing going to be in terms of shared values or shared interests? And if so, how do we, um, how do we frame it? Thank you, Rory. Uh, wonderful to be here at the ACL Forum, also together with Harinder and Ritika. And let's try to disagree. Uh, let's try to make this as Indian as possible and, and, uh, and have a good ADA and a good discussion full of uh, divergent points of view. You know, Rory, let me break this down in, in three points, uh, your, your question. One, is India's democracy backsliding? Is it suffering? Uh, should partners uh, uh, around the world cons be concerned about that? You know, I, let me, let me be, give it counterintuitive and provocative on this. Uh, I actually think um, India is uh, more democratic than ever, and that is exactly a challenge and a threat. And what I mean is that if you look at India's democracy over the last 10 to 20 years, um, it's actually... Uh, reaching records level, record levels of participation. We saw this in Prime Minister Modi's re-election in 2019. It's not easy to get re-elected with a larger mandate, which is exactly what his party managed, with a record voter turnout, a record number of women voting, uh, minorities. So across the spectrum, uh, Indian society is mobilizing, is becoming more vocal, is joining political institutions, this is a very young country uh, with an average age, average age of around 27 or 30s. So you have really three revolutions in progress in this country. Let's not forget this is a country that only opened up its economy in 1991. We're into year 30 of some very timid economic reforms still. So that's a major economic transition where people have ambitions, aspirations. India's GDP per capita is around $2,000 American dollars, that's five times less than China, that's 30, three zero times less than Singapore. Uh, you have a variety of social groups that are mobilizing, uh, lower caste groups, different uh, um, socioeconomic regional groups. All of this is leading to turbulence. And therefore why I see that actually is a healthy sign of participation of joining the system. It's also leading to stress, to challenges, to illiberalism, to populism, to nationalism, uh, to a variety, of course, I think what we'd call non-democratic or I'd say illiberal uh, movements that are also, I think, nurturing um, or so feeding off this transition. And you know, if you look at this, it's not so different from the larger movements we've seen happening in the United States, in Brazil, in Europe, I'd say even to some extent in Australia, so the challenges are the same, but I'd say in India is just a much larger country. It's going much more faster. It's a more recent, more rapid, deeper transformation that this country is going through. But I think we should keep in mind that there's a categorical difference between India and you mentioned China, for example. India today is a functioning democracy. It's one of the most formidable experiments in democracy in the developing world. 1,400 million people, voting, joining the systems uh, with an independent rule of law, uh, civilian supremacy of the military, which we don't see in all parts of Asia, secularism, federalism. So I think that's, that's important and we should keep that in mind in the, in the larger scheme of things. Number two, willing to join a democratic bloc or alliances. I think Rory, you've done a lot of work on this. There's this idea that the Quad, for example, the US, Japan, India and Australia are somehow now a democratic bloc. I see this in the sense that I think values have always been there. India has always been a democracy. They don't determine India's strategic alignments, but they facilitate. They make it easier, I think, for India to work with Australia, with Japan, with the US, with European countries. You know, India's foreign minister, who I believe is, I think, speaking as part of this forum later today, 
uh, had this wonderful expression where someone asked him, what alliances are you going to choose? The Americans, the Russians, the, the Quad, Japan. And he said, comfort is the new commitment. Now, comfort denotes, I think, a certain ideological tendency that you're comfortable with systems that are similar to you, uh, countries that speak the same language, the same political language, the same values. And I'd say that's coming out quite clearly in India's strategic plans. For example, on data governance, you know, how do you develop a new framework, new legislation that balances privacy between competing imperatives from the state, citizens, and the market? On this, you see India clearly, for example, having a very strong dialogue with the European Union on data privacy. I don't see India discussing data privacy and legislation with the Chinese or the Russians. So I think on the Quad, for example, again, Rory, you've been doing a lot of work and Australia has been taking the initiative on this. On tech, technology is not just a neutral, fungible element, right? There's a strong normative element to how you regulate tech, how do you use tech, how do you apply tech? And I think there's a different framework, again, that India shares with fellow democracies and does not share, for example, with China. Let me end on the last point. Is India really, therefore, a reliable democratic partner? Uh, I think uh, Rory had pinged me about this in your, in your email uh, prior to the session. And let me just bring this up also, because I think, you know, here again, I'd say yes and no. India is reliable in terms of uh, an architecture that tries to balance China. Uh, in India today, you don't hear any more the debate about, is China a problem? These days you discuss how to deal with problem China. That is the great Indian debate. But second, on the other hand, I think in India, no one is under the illusion that you can afford to alienate, isolate, um, you know, completely sort of marginalize China from the international economy, international system. And that's where I think all countries have the same dilemma. How do you sort of deal with China? Uh, how do you develop coalitions of like-minded partners like the Quad, for example, that try to shape the incentives for China to change its behavior? And there, India is certainly playing ball with Australia and with fellow democracies to try to change the structure um, uh, that has been actually quite permissive for China to take on, I'd say, a more aggressive, assertive role, uh, in particular in Asia. Thank you, Constantino. I'm glad you've uh, you, you've really opened up the the China question there, because uh, of course, one thing I'd like to come back to is that India-China relationship. We all saw. I think with um, you know with some uh, well really shock and concern the um, the bloodshed last year um, in the Golan Valley and we've seen the you know the, the risk of confrontation worsening there so I'd like to come back to that China factor but I, I am glad that you've noted a few other things I'm glad that you've um, reminded us that we do indeed have Indian External Affairs Minister Jai Shankar as the keynote speaker for. The, uh, for the forum, in fact, giving the, the Craw Federation, I should say, uh, later on this evening, uh, Canberra time. You've also, I think, um, noted a couple of important points about the scale of Indian democracy. And just for Australian listeners who perhaps don't fully, um, fully comprehend what we're talking about here, it always astounds me that every Indian uh, national election is by definition, the largest exercise in democracy in history, each time uh, it grows. It also, uh, I think, it is worth noting that India has uh, an electoral commission that is um, pretty defiantly independent. And I know that electoral um, organisations or institutions around the world look with a certain degree of envy uh, at what India has. I suspect the United States uh, does or should in that regard. And um, I like to remind my students that India has more democratically elected politicians than the rest of the world put together, if you count local government panchayats and so forth. So look, there is something on scale there that is very difficult to comprehend. And I'm really um, uh, you know, pleased and, and, and intrigued as well, the way that you've, you've really uh, offered that, 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 that counterpoint to the, the narrative that there's a, an inevitable illiberalism. Uh, but let's keep that conversation open and instead I might now go to Harinda to Harinda Sidhu for your views having heard uh, both what you've heard today Harinda but also 
building on your experience, your long observation of India, your, um, you, you know, your, your, your intensive uh, role there as, as High Commissioner, um, how do you see the, I guess, the realistic ambitions for the Australia-India relationship across the, um, the full spectrum from economics to security, to uh, technology, to society? Big question. That's a very big question. Um, thank you, Rory. I have to say, just bouncing off uh, Constantino's last point about democracy, um, I observed, uh, I've, you know, all around me, the Indian election in 2019, and I think as an Australian, uh, it's really staggering uh, to be in the midst of that and to see uh, Indian democracy in action in that way and in that scale. It truly is a remarkable thing to see, and and, and it really uh, stays with me as the bedrock of my optimism about India. Uh, I am an Indian India optimist. I'm not a starry-eyed one, um, but I think that when you think about the sorts of things we've been talking about, uh, Ritika's point about how, you know, uh, and Costino's about how uh, it's only since 1991, which is not that long ago, that India's economic opening happened. When you look at the bilateral relationship, what you're looking at is a dramatic transformation in what has been a fairly short space of time. Uh, in just the last few years, we've gone from having, it's always been a good relationship, but to something that has accelerated beyond, I think, uh, if I think back to when I first took up my role in 2016 in New Delhi, I think I would have been uh, amazed to consider where we are now. The quad is up and running. It was, uh, you know, in 2016, a really highly contested thing. Uh, but it's not just up and running, it is thriving, it is deepening. The levels of trust and confidence amongst the, uh, the four countries is very strong. Um, it has certainly brought Australia and India closer together. Uh, despite all the naysayers, Australia participated in Malabar exercise last year and is likely to do so again this year. Um, there's been a level of intensity in the bilateral contact between our ministers and leaders uh, at a level that I think we have not seen at any time in, um, in Australia-India history. Uh, and, of course, the, the crowning glory, in a way, <laughs> was the uh, virtual summit that took place last year between the two prime ministers and the signing off of the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. So we have aligned strategic interests, as, as uh, my colleagues and uh, co-panelists have mentioned. Uh, we really very much see the world eye to eye. We come at things in a very similar way between Australia and India because of the fact that we are uh, democracies. I do think that the growth in the Indian diaspora in Australia is a um, is helps the focus. I think on India, it, 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 I think you can over egg what a diaspora can deliver, but certainly that it does ground the relationship very importantly from the Australian perspective and also from the Indian perspective because Indians now have relatives in Australia. They have much more textured sense of what Australia is. Um, I think that, that all of that gives you great grounds for optimism, but there's a couple of things to bear in mind. One is that we really do have to guard against um, overreach and complacency. And I think that those are the things that, that uh, carry risks for us. And so it, by that, I mean, essentially on the complacency front, uh, taking India a little bit for granted uh, and taking each other for granted, just assuming that because these fundamentals are in place, uh, we don't necessarily need to attend to them uh, and to nurture them. We really do need to maintain effort to sustain and develop the relationships. Um, and the, the, there's an issue around overreach, and, and that really uh, goes to a point that I think Peter Varghese made when he wrote his uh, India Economic Strategy. He sort of he pointed out that we should not we should take India on its own terms. That India is not the next China. It is uh, a qualitatively different relationship, and I think we should not place more on the India relationship than it can actually deliver. This means we need to see the relationship very clearly, and we need to work with what we have and what we can realistically achieve in the relationship. Uh, to ask too much of each other, I think, uh, runs a real risk of failure. And I don't mean that in any sense of dampening ambition, but I'm just saying you can achieve a great deal 
um, but we should be really clear about where we can where we can get to. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to make the point that relationships are two-way things. One thing that happens, certainly from my perspective as an Australian diplomat and an Australian former High Commissioner, is that you tend to focus very much on what it is Australia can do. Uh, but actually, it also does require India to come to the party as well. And so both of us have to move in the same direction. Both of us need to do the work to understand each other and to build a relationship. But I see that happening. I see that happening in both directions in a very considered and uh, cooperative way between the two countries. And of course, we'll all have our bumps and scrape up against each other, but uh, the, 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 the trend line is, is you know, progressing, it's forward looking and it's very, very positive. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Harinder. I'm going to just come back to you very briefly on the economic relationship, if I may, because, you know, one, um, one really striking feature of the overall relationship in recent years, I think, is how, um, how substantial and pronounced the security relationship has become. And as, as someone who you know, in my um, original engagement with India 20 years ago, working on security issues, uh, being posted to Delhi at a time when our relationship was not so great, um, you know, and in a security context, a, a nuclear context that I think, you know, is very much history now. Um, I've been really impressed by how closely we've found that security convergence. And that's great. But in a sense, it's overtaken the economic um, complementarities, or it sometimes seems it has. So you've mentioned the Peter Varghese uh, report and Peter Varghese's um, great work in that regard. We've, we've noticed Tony Abbott uh, in India recently, and we've heard some pretty positive messages about formalising the economic relationship. But we also know about, I guess, the difficulties of anything resembling a true FTA um, politically in India. So. I'd love a little bit more um, specificity about, I guess, where you see um, the economic opportunities. Um, yes, thank you. Um, uh, isn't it interesting that you opened up by by pointing to the, um, the the dominance of the strategic relationship? And I think that that, in its own right, uh, illustrates how India is different to the typical. Uh, relationship that Australia forms in our region, which has always been led by the economic and trade relationship. And, and that goes, I think, to the fact that it is a qualitatively different place. There is a qualitatively different set of drivers. Uh, and uh, I don't think we should fret too much about the fact that the strategic relationship has taken the, 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 the front running here. But I do agree that we're not going to get to an enduring relationship unless we also follow that up with a substantial economic relationship. Now, we can fret about how, you know, the economic relationship is insubstantial, but again, that is compared to what? Uh, um, it, we did see some slippage, but at the time when I was in India, you know, India was already our fourth or fifth largest trading partners. It was in the top five. It's still, it's a very significant relationship. It slipped last year because of the economics, of course, and it may slip further again, but I have no doubt it will recover. Uh, what we have to uh, accept is that the size and the shape of our economic relationship with India will be unique and it will be different. Um, we're not going to get a replication, I don't think, with India of what we have with China, where one or two commodities just uh, entirely drive the economic relationship. What we will have is a very large trading and investment relationship. And this is a point that Peter Varghese made, which is the relationship won't only be trade led, it will also be investment there'll be a significant investment component to the economic relationship. And it will be, it'll be across a number of sectors uh, and in sectors that we don't usually consider as uh, you know, leading economic sectors, such as ec education, which is of course a very large part of the relationship, I think will continue to be a large part of the relationship. So um, uh, the India economic strategy, I think was pitched well it recognised the importance of having a free trade agreement, but it also recognised that the uh, entirety of an economic relationship doesn't 
rest only in a free trade agreement. So you can look at all these components that actually build the economic relationship. We've got the SICA, the free trade agreement work that is now looking like it's moving forward again. We've got the India economic strategy that reminds us that there are many other dimensions to the economic relationship. And we've also got the, sort, the, the specific economic commitments that came out of the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, which actually look at uh, the economic relationship being in, integral to the, to the strategic relationship. So, look, we will get a large economic relationship. We already have a large economic relationship. It will just look different from what we might expect. Thank you. And that's a good point at which um, to remind uh, participants to start lining up your questions, please. Um, either raising your hands or preferably lining up written questions in the Q&A uh, with your name, we can come back to you. I can see that it's a, it's a pretty high powered group uh, observing or participating in this conversation. So I wanna hear from many of you, but I'm gonna ask one last question of our other two panelists before we go to the group's questions. And that really goes back to the youth factor, I guess, to the, uh, you know, the average age in India, as, as we've said, is, is so young. I mean, I know, you know I, I no longer can keep pace with the statistics over, you know, the precise or the approximate number of Indians under the age of 25 or, 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 or 27, but it's, you know, it's in the hundreds of millions, um, larger than most other countries on earth. And what young Indians think about the world, I think is extraordinarily important and is a question that often hasn't been asked um, systematically in the past. Uh, Ritika, I know that your think tank ORF did an opinion poll recently on this, and I'm not gonna put you on the spot with any exact statistics from that unless you have them to hand, but it would be just interesting to hear from you first and then from Constantino about whether you think younger Indians on balance um, have a different worldview um, than the one that you know, many of us you know, who, who, who imagine the India of the 20th century uh, would have. Um, from what I recall, and uh, uh, because um, from what I recall of the, uh, the youth survey that um, or brought out, one, I think it's an excellent step that or undertook such a study in the first place. But from what I recall, and I think this is also um, uh, this is also reflected in a lot of my own conversations um, with my peers, which is that uh, there is a greater I think as Tina already made the point that, you know, today there's no question about um, whether China is a problematic neighbor. The, the question is how do we manage this problematic neighbor? Um, I think that sea change has actually uh, bled over into the youth population. And, um, I, and because of this also then there is um, the importance that the Indian youth today uh, see in, for example, pursuing ties with the US. It ranks high in uh, countries that the Indian youth today deem important for India to engage with. Um, funnily enough, uh, here I wanna mention um, uh, uh, the point that Ambassador Sindhu, Sindhu raised about education, um, because Australia actually ranked pretty high in terms of, um, I think one of the points about, you know, uh, which countries do you think are important for India? And Australia actually, I think, um, was uh, for Indians. And I think Australia ranked above Russia and in the EU, I think, and I, and I strongly believe it was definitely because of the, the education ties that, that India and Australia have um, between them. So I think um, the, the sort of old adage, you know, there's been this um, uh, uh, foreign minister talks about, you know, um, dispensing with the old dogmas of the past. And I think that um, the, uh, the, the younger population, um, which is going to, we're going to peak, our working age population is going to peak by about 2045. Here's another statistic to add. Um, uh, there's a greater recognition that opportunity lies in a uh, range of countries, including the West, and they're not particularly tied to this sense of wanting to um, not partner with the US. I think those older, um, uh, uh, those hesitations, those traditional hesitations, will not implicate the younger generation to the same degree as they did um, or as they yeah, as they did um, uh, our uh, policymakers up till now. And uh, I think um, under uh, for the last five, six, seven years, increasing outreach, in India's increasing foreign policy outreach has actually opened up a larger vista 
for India's youth to engage with, whether it's in terms of education, but also in terms of business opportunities. To think that, you know, India today has instituted a working group um, to discuss trade and investment potential between India and Uzbekistan. You know, at one point you'd be like, why is it necessary? Where is Uzbekistan? But I think as India is, is, is also um, uh, trying to form a, 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 a networked architecture of partnerships, it is also opening, it is also exposing um, younger, the younger generations to more opportunities abroad. And so I think it's not gonna be as constrained by the traditional dogmas of the past. Fantastic, thank you. And I'll, um, I, I'll go to uh, Tino and then I just wanna add a couple of other uh, reflections, Tino. Uh, thanks Rory. I think uh, just to follow up on her interest, I think, I think extremely important point on the sort of um, two way street between India and Australia and how the economics and uh, trade investments pillar has been progressing in absolute terms, but is relatively weaker compared to the security one. I would say more than strategic, we're talking about the defense and security cooperation between India and Australia, which is phenomenal. And uh, it's, I think across the board, a phenomenal progress on the bilateral relationship. But I think in India now what we see is a very state-led openness. You hear the noise about uh, self-reliance, economic protectionism, which by the way, again, is similar across the board worldwide. There's nothing exceptional about India. But what's happening, which is slightly different from the past, is that the Indian government, I think, is trying to securitize and strategize its trade and economics relations with various partners. That means pushing back on China, which is still India's largest trade partner. We saw that last year with a variety of new investment screening mechanisms and trying to reduce India's dependence on China. Second, we see this through this whole business, Rory, you've been involved and many others in Australia on critical supply chains, where really the Indian government is going sector by sector saying, here we have to work with the Japanese, here we have to work with the Thais, here with the Australians, here with the Europeans. These are sort of a very strategic and governmental-led policy, which has its drawbacks, obviously, especially if into uh, classical economics and believe in a purely uh, traditional free trade strategy. And third element is the private sector. The government is working very closely with very big private sector players in India that are tying up with their fellow private sector partners in other countries and pushing through specific agendas of investments and trade and special sort of supply chains there. So I think that, that sets uh, uh, India apart uh, currently from, from the past. On, on the new generation, three quick departures, Rory. One is the China threat. It surprises me whenever I speak to young people anecdotally, but whenever I also engage with the younger generation of Indian diplomats, Indian administrators, uh, Indian military officers, there is today a centrality of China threat, which was not there. Despite having fought a war in 1962, and these having been you know, enemy states for many decades, today that salience is centerpiece in the new generation strategic worldview. Number two, economic openness. The younger generations in India today, unlike previous generations, see economic interdependence, connectivity, the language of business and transactionalism as being in India's interest, unlike the past. So there, that openness towards openness is, I think, again, a second departure. And finally, nationalism. And this is going to be narrated. You have today not so different from the Chinese approach. And of course, I'm caveating with this with two different models, two different systems. But the sense that this is India's moment, that India needs to push back, that India needs to educate and correct Westerners about India, that India needs to push and articulate better its own narrative about its democracy, about its right role in, the, in world institutions and its right place. And that is going to be inherited because there are younger people that that's, come, that's coming particularly from the youth today that is saying, this is our moment and we're not gonna put up with a, a variety of biases and perceptions and we need to push back. And that is going to affect, I think, India's relations with a variety of partners, including Australia. Thanks for that, Tino. And I'd note, um, again, from the opinion polling that I've seen, um, the ORF poll and, and indeed some polling that I conducted a number of years ago in, in a different role in India, there has been that pretty extraordinary shift. You know, Pakistan is still there, 
uh, as a source of concern and threat perception. And I imagine, and I would like to come to this before the end of our conversation uh, at some point, that the uh, the calamity in Afghanistan is going to uh, you know, reinforce those concerns in India. So, you know, there is a question as to how well can India now balance all of the risks around its um, periphery. But I have seen, you know, I have seen a lot of evidence of that generational shift. We've got a couple of questions, I think, coming in from uh, some of the audience or some of the participants. So I will go to them but I will um, come back to you all uh, as, as, as we go along. Firstly, I might go to uh, a question from High Commissioner uh, Manpreet Voira. So um, I might read out uh, the High Commissioner's question. This is the Indian High Commissioner in Canberra, uh, recently arrived, and um, it's uh, re really great to, um, to, to have you with us, uh, High Commissioner. Your question, if Australia's relations with China were to improve again, what would the impact on the way Australia looks at, sorry, what would be the impact on the way Australia looks at the value uh, from India or other new partners? Now, I wonder, that's a question for all of you, I guess, um, but it, it goes to a larger question as well. And I think it's whether Australia's relations with China um, somehow stabilise in the near term. And I must say from hearing the uh, tre Australian Treasurer's remarks this morning to this conference. I don't anticipate that happening anytime soon uh, for those relationships, that relationship to become somewhat more harmonious. But it goes to the question of to what extent are Australia and India positing their closer partnership on the fact that we're both having our own sets of problems with China. So I will put the High Commissioner's question to the three of you, but I'm also interested uh, in the question of, you know, what if India manages to find its own new equilibrium with China? What happens then? Um, we'll go in order. Uh, Ritika first. Um, that's actually a great question. And I think um, perhaps, uh, you know, I, I've mentioned that this is India's sort of window of opportunity, right? Constantino put it another way where he um, uh, said that, you know, we recognize the, the, the sort of potential, that shift that we're seeing, the generational shift that we're seeing, right? Um, this window of opportunity critically not only rests on India's own ambitions, but also the crisis of what I call credibility and viability of the Chinese development model that it has been exporting to other countries, principally through its Belt and Road Initiative. And I think this is a moment, just as it is for India, for other countries as well, as COVID has um, brought glaringly to the fore, that dominance on any one actor is not in interests of any of, of the of, of the taker, and therefore, in order to ensure greater equilibrium, greater um, uh, reciprocity, I think it, it behooves it is in the interest of uh, countries like Australia, like India, to make note of that. Um, talking, and I'm going to focus specifically in response to uh, the High Commissioner's question. I'm going to focus on, for example, the India-China relationship. Um, the rhetoric is. It cannot be business as usual. We have crossed a red line um, because of the loss of lives, because of the uh, increasing um, skirmishes and the expectations effectively of an active um, uh, border in the uh, coming uh, years. Um, at the same time, we've also seen, for example, trade between India and China not actually having had a significant impact between last year and this year, outside of, of course, the pitfalls, uh, the economic uh, implications uh, due to COVID, the shortages, the blockages, et cetera. And I think this points to, um, the, uh, to, um, to how countries like India have to strategize their engagement in view of key objectives, which include um, uh, increased resilience in their trading and their investment um, Knee-jerk reactions, for example, cancelling, I think India cancelled a, um, uh, an order, a, a, a manufacturing order of uh, uniforms from a Chinese supplier of its Indian Olympic team's uniforms, if I, if I, if I, if I recall correctly. I mean, such knee-jerk reactions do not amount to any change in the, uh, in, in, in the, um, in, in the trading relationship. I think a deeper rethink is required. And funnily enough, now I'm gonna uh, also step uh, or cross over to the point about that was made about India and Australian relationship 
not being like that of India, of Australia and China's relationship. And here I think there is a huge scope. China's rise was predicated on it becoming a manufacturing power. India does not hold that uh, mantle and is likely to not hold that mantle in the coming, um, in, in the near future. We've got Vietnam and Bangladesh that are just, if not more appetizing for companies as they look at China plus one, one model of say, as they seek to diversify their risks and relocate. Um, and I've lost my train of thought. Oh no. Um, sorry, can you just remind me what I was saying? You know Look, so the, well, the question is, I mean, I think you, I don't think, I don't think you actually have lost your train of thought because it's, it's a pretty rich answer. Uh, but look, the, I think, and I'll, I'll go to Tino in a moment, come back to you. The question is really, um, to my mind, you know, what is it that will change the Australia-India relationship if Australia finds itself somehow improving its relations with China or if India does? If I could just finish, I'm so sorry. I, yeah. I just, I've, I've got my train of thought. Um, what I wanted to say was that absolutely improve your, your the, 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 the trading engagement that you have with China. But at the same time, there are new spaces such as technology, such as connectivity, infrastructure, such as climate change, such as um, uh, innovative technology, low cost development, such as solar panels. There are new emerging spaces hmm. where um, countries can balance a still strong relationship with China on trade with um, other partners. That's the point that I was trying to make. No, thank you. And I think, um, Tina, I'd be interested in hearing your view as well. And I think the, I, I just would note in passing that, you know, one of the perceptions, in my view, a, a misperception around there has been that somehow, um, you know, the the reasonably um, confident relationship Australia did have with China maybe 10 or 15 years ago was an impediment to relations with India. I mean, is it really all going to be so zero sum? So I think uh, High Commissioner Vora is hitting the nail on the head in terms of addressing a critical issue of trust and reliability between a variety of partners, in this case, India and Australia. I think Harinder is the best person placed to reply to this question, but let me attempt one proposition, uh, which is, uh, Rory, what you hinted at. I get this exact same question from the opposite sense. Mm. I'm asked repeatedly by Japanese officials, Southeast Asian, ASEAN officials, European officials, Bangladeshi or Nepali officials. Is India reliable in terms of really pushing it back against China? Are you really going to play this out in the long term? Are you here to protect us when you know, uh, things heat up again? From various perspectives, right? Different countries, different interests, but all of them suffer from the same concern. You know, where do we, how do we distribute our eggs into different baskets? And how reliable is the Indian basket if we put our eggs into that? If we do more security cooperation, more naval exercises, if we enter a particular trade agreement with India that China is not going to be happy about. So I would say just to maybe the realist in me will say no one is reliable, no one is trustworthy. I hope the practitioners in the room will agree with me. Uh, in the end, it really falls to that. But, and here's a but in terms of what Ritika has been, I think, uh, stressing, countries are watching. Countries expect more from India and Australia. And I think in that sense, the India-Australia relationship has become much more reliable as an indicator, as I think a, a, a larger signpost for several countries that are observing this turbulence in Asia, strategic rivalry and competition, and that beyond strategy and security want developmental alternatives focused often on democratic solutions. That's where I think the ideological thing matters, the fact that India and Australia will offer different technological, developmental, digital solutions to these countries, multilateral solutions, than China or other actors. And even the United States has a different approach in many ways. So I think every bilateral partnership, trilateral, quadrilateral bilateral ship in the Indo Pacific has its own DNA, its own USP to equip these countries to navigate this greater turbulence. Um, and no one will in the end really rely on one or the other or a third or fourth. I think the proliferation of institutions, the mini laterals, Rory, you've again worked on so much, uh, that proliferation is a healthy indicator of greater alternatives in the Indo-Pacific today. 
Thanks, um, Tino. Harinda, um, how much would you like to say on this question of, um, of reliability? Well, I think Australia is very reliable. Is that the right answer? No. Um, so I, I just wanted to, um, to just go to this question because I do want to challenge the premise that sits underneath that question, uh, which is that um, there is only one driver for the relationship. Uh, that seems to be a premise, which is a shared concern about China. And the second is an assumption that these relationships or go forward uh, with the greatest respect to the High Commissioner. I'm, I'm just sort of being a little bit uh, um, sketchy here, but uh, uh, that that it's transactional. Uh, and, and I don't think uh, that that's what the High Commissioner intends in his question, but I can see how some people might read it that way. Um, so what I want to be really clear about is that I think uh, we both, we all understand that foreign policy is a long-term game. Uh, I think that uh, you know, the, that there are a number of things that have brought Australia and India closer together in recent times. They have to do, for example, with the uh, with India's growing size of its economy, which accelerated quite considerably in the last decade, making India a much more attractive economic partner for Australia from Australia's perspective. Um, it has to do with India's um, greater uh, outreach and engagement in the world, particularly uh, in recent years, the deepening of its relationship with the United States, where Australia then naturally uh, feels a greater uh, interest and comfort because we're now all working in similar, um, similar uh, strategic spaces as well. So there are multiple things that have uh, brought the relationship together much closer. Uh, again, I don't think uh, these things are zero sum, and it's certainly the case that all relationships go through their ups and downs, and uh, and that there is a space, I think, for Australia and India, uh, which I believe isn't going to be a very enduring relationship out into the long term. I think that both sides actually are reliable in that respect because both sides can see that there is a long term value in investing in this relationship. Uh, for the long-term future of our regional stability and security. And, and the last thing I want to say is that it's all underpinned by the reframing of our strategic um, interest as, as lying in the Indo-Pacific. That's what fundamentally we share. That is where uh, the centre of gravity, I suppose, is starting to shift to, and both countries in defining that that, that is our area of primary strategic interest have by by necessity and by by design captured the other country as a, as a key strategic partner in that region. Thank you, um, Harinda, uh, spoken like an analyst and a diplomat, uh, I would say. Uh, I'm going to, uh, again, push for some questions from the audience uh, who have been surprisingly shy. And there are three other participants in this group who's names I have on a little list that I'm going to start um, prompting in a moment, uh, unless they jump in. But I note, we do have a question in the meantime from uh, Subo Banaji. Uh, so I'll read out Subo's question if I, if I may. Um, so Subo, your question, an, an India-Australia relationship that is based on genuine mutual respect needs to be conducted on the basis that both sides have important things to learn from each other. It would be great to hear from the panel about some things that Australia should be looking to learn from the contemporary Indian experience. So here's your chance, uh, colleagues. I'll go to Ritika first and then Constantino uh, and Harinda too. I mean, what can Australia learn from the Indian experience? Um, that's actually a really great question because I think it's often uh, termed into uh, what India can gain in terms of trade or investment from its partners. And I think here um, there is a definitely, um, and I think here one of the, 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 the potentials um, in terms of India's experience is actually in terms of the youth component, right? Uh, increased engagement um, with the youth, but also um, in matters of research and development, in matters of uh, it, low cost innovation, in matters of climate change. I think there is a one of India's leadership ambitions when it comes to the global stage is to export 
its developmental solutions around the world. And I think here there is some scope for greater engagement to see, okay, um, the kind of solutions that Indians are coming out with, what kind of climate change um, problems that they're addressing, um, what kind of developmental experiences um, India is, is has to offer to the world and how Australia can partner with India on that um, in this exportation and in this promotion of India's uh, developmental experience, particular emphasis on, uh, again, renewable energy, um, a particular emphasis on uh, uh, inclusion, digital inclu uh, technology uh, based developmental solutions. Um, I think that's an area that is forward looking, um, but also ties together in, in Australia beyond a conversation of trade and investment in strategic sectors. Thanks. Tina, what do you think? No, I think uh, one is a very macro point. The other one is a micro. One is strategic patience and flexibility. Now, there's one thing that India has consistently brought to the table since the 1950s, that is autonomy of its as a territorial integrity of the country, economic development, the survival and flourishing of the country has been premised on diversifying its partnerships, taking its time, keeping flexibility, which I think actually the Americans, as we see these days, have not been very good at, which is a function of power. Where you have excess power, you're a superpower, you can afford to do mistakes, absorb the cost, pack up your bags and go home, which is what the US has done over the last 20, 30 years repeatedly. Uh, I think India, given its very difficult environment, threatening in some ways, but also unstable, diverse in South Asia, has learned to be strategically patient, flexible, uh, not interventionist, uh, and working with time and not against time. And I think actually current circumstances around the world are forcing all of us to recognize the merits of that patience, that flexibility, and the limits of power in terms of trying to influence, trying to force choices on other countries. Uh, and I think that that is something Australia could learn from India, particularly because Australia obviously came from that, I think, sort of security alliance system with, uh, led by the US. The micro point, uh, building up on what Ritika was saying, is offering developmental solutions uh, to uh, developing countries in the larger Indo-Pacific, from the Eastern African coast, Indian Ocean region, Southeast Asia, these are countries that are battling with difficult transitions, with competing demands from the Chinese, the Americans, the Indians, the ASEAN, turbulent space. Uh, I think India has a wonderful track record of equipping institutions, training officials in these countries, which is really about good governance and sustainable democratic development in the long term. So the more I think Australia can work with India doing that, uh, the better, I think, for regional order, uh, peace and stability. Thank you. Harinda, would you like to comment on what, um, what we can learn from each other and perhaps what Australia can learn from the Indian experience? Yes, I, I had a lot of time to think about this because there were many things about India I admired, I think, when I was there and I still do. Now, here's two. One is how to deal with plural plurality goodness me it's a difficult word but um if you think about india it's you know 31 states um there's a constant negotiation in inside its um political system keeping this democracy together keeping the country functioning which you know from observers on the outside you often wonder how it gets done because there are so many actors in the process but indians are particularly skilled at dealing with that level of diversity and coming up with an outcome and if you think about the world we're living in now um, multipolar many laterals plurilaterals uh, this is the way foreign policy is conducted and i actually think india is very very skilled in doing that. Uh, they, they are genuinely able to keep several conversations on the go at the same time and yet arrive at a conclusion. Understand that you don't need a unitary top-down system in order to achieve outcomes. Find ways to achieve outcomes and get progress in a very messy environment. And I think that that's something I genuinely admire because as Australians, I think we have a desire for order uh, but I think Indians have understood how to work in a world that is uh, more complex than that. Uh, of course, we all do, but, um, but I think India has a particular skill. 
And the second thing is, I think, in innovation. And uh, Tino just touched on this a minute ago, but when I think about uh, it's not both countries are innovative. What India is particularly good at is actually delivering innovative uh, solutions uh, uh, in scientific innovation or technology or whatever, but at low cost and at scale. Uh, and, you know, when you think about the challenges the developing world is going to ha has now and is going to have in recovering from COVID, uh, that I think is a particular thing for the Australian aid program, for example, that we can genuinely learn and partner with India on. Thank you, um, Harinda. I've got two other questions lined up. And I should just add, Harinda, that um, I, I reinforced a few of those points from my own observation. I think there, there is a kind of resilience and anti-fragility that one encounters in India every, every, every day that um, I think you know, we, we, we could learn from. Um, we've got some questions from several participants, uh, Brendan Sargent, uh, Natasha Kassam, and uh, Cosmo Jones. So I'll see if I can get to all of you. And, Brendan, I'm going to um, read out your question first, but I'm going to build on your question to bring Afghanistan in as well as I threatened to do earlier. So Brendan Sargent, uh, my colleague at uh, ANU, former uh, Australian Associate Secretary of Defence, uh, asks, in Australia, we focus on the Indo-Pacific, but India has vast interests in Central Asia, an area of enormous ferment and change and contest. Is an Indo-Pacific focus viable in the context of Central Asian challenges? Does, Indo, does India have enough strategic capability? And, and I think let's put Afghanistan in that question as, as well. Uh, Ritika? Um, exactly. My mind went immediately to Afghanistan. And this is a challenge not just for India, but the broader Asian landscape. Um, and indeed a challenge for counterterrorism um, at the global level. Um, and I think that India necessarily because of its geography is of course implicated and currently uh, does not actually have the uh, necessary leverage to participate in conversations that are happening about Afghanistan uh, that include Russia and China and Turkey and Iran and, the, and of course the, the, um, the uh, traditional Western powers, um, uh, but that India is trying to create space for itself. And I think it's a very fluid situation. I think it's too early to say which direction India is going to go in, which direction any of the other powers are going to go in, the regional uh, players are going to go in with respect to um, Afghanistan. Um, and uh, and that is a challenge that India perforce has to address. At the same time, I do not think it's going to come at the cost of um, the Indo-Pacific vision. Uh, India has made institutional changes, for example, um, uh, creating the Indo-Pacific division and its Ministry of External Affairs. There is the, the narrative beyond the rhetoric, even its plurilateral engagements increasingly signify an increased attention to and engagement within the ambit of this vision of an open and free and inclusive Indo-Pacific. I think that will, it, the two are not going to come at the cost of each other. And this goes to the point exactly of uh, what um, uh, uh, the previous speaker mentioned about the flexibility and the Indian capacity to deal with multiple issues. India is still dealing with COVID and yet the number of uh, foreign policy interactions that uh, India held virtually Yes, to discuss the response to COVID, but also to strengthen existing bilaterals and trilaterals uh, is testament to the fact that India is not going to be hamstrung by, um, in fact, in fact, one could actually argue that the Afghanistan challenge actually fits um, or actually um, becomes an, a part, a key part of India's uh, drive for, for a multipolar Asia in the sense that it wants to be included in these conversations and it's going to create space for itself, fingers crossed, um, in a way that it's able to secure its, uh, its, um, its, its territory and sovereignty. Thanks, uh, Tino. Well, I think on, on Central Asia, there's only one big debate you see in India, which is always, is the Indo-Pacific a maritime sort of outlook and everything else northwards and eastwards is Continental, Belt and Road, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Russia, China, India. So this, this, I think that's one school of thought in India. Um, I'm of a different view. I think the Indo-Pacific, and I think that's the mainstream thinking with the Indian government, is not about the territorial dimension of the Indo-Pacific. I, I actually think the Indo-Pacific is really a signaling, a signaling device 
uh, between India and its partners about the future order. Provocatively, I sometimes say that even Brazil or Senegal have a stake in the Indo-Pacific, just to make the point that the Indo-Pacific may be immediately about the change in order, a more multipolar, less multipolar order in Asia, or Asia Pacific, or Indo-Pacific in that territorial dimension. But the Indo-Pacific and India's long-term orientation towards that idea of the Indo-Pacific is actually how to manage the rise of China, the relative decline of the US compared to 20 years ago, and a system in transition. And there, I don't think there's a big difference there between what happens at seas and what happens in the hinterland up in the mountains in Afghanistan or Central Asia. Uh, India is equally concerned uh, about uh, stability and uh, order, I think, in both those theaters. Thanks, uh, Tino. And I, I, I couldn't um, personally agree with you that much more, I, I fear. I mean, I, I do think the Indo-Pacific is, is more than a geographic expression, but I, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, it is about multipolarity. And I'd note that, of course, that the, the road in the Belt and Road is, in fact, a maritime Silk Road. So, you know, China is not thinking of an either or either. Harinda, do you want to touch on this question? Uh, I'm quite happy to go to the other questions. We've got three more lined up. So I'll let, would you like to just address this or not? Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's much more I can add. I think, you know, um, Tino and Ritika have pretty much covered it. Um, you know, uh, your foreign policy interests are very large. They're not confined to the Indo-Pacific or anywhere, however you might want to define them. And I think India is a sophisticated and mature power, so it can certainly manage those. So I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Great. Well, look, we've got three questions left in the um, Q&A box and we've got about 19 minutes, I believe. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to read all three questions out and I'm going to let each, oh, each panellist choose whether they wish to address um, any of the questions. You must, ad must address at least one, um, but I'm quite happy for you to take this as a bit of a smorgasbord because there are three excellent and quite diverse questions. The first one is from Natasha Kassam uh, from the, the Lowy Institute. And Natasha goes back really, uh, I guess, with um, some more fidelity to those questions about uh, democracy and, and, and liberalism. And she notes specifically that Australian foreign policy has increasingly been focused on democracy. Uh, and she notes that recently, um, according to our PM, liberal democracy, but at the same time, Freedom House has recently downgraded India uh, from free to partly free, that's free and partly free with capital letters. Um, is it the idea, or is the idea of values-based foreign policy from Australia or even from the US or others, I would say, is that a limitation accordingly on the relationship with India? The second question uh, that I'll go to is actually from uh, Gareth Evans from, the uh, former chancellor of the university and of course as for, former Australian foreign minister and much else besides. And Gareth uh, still plays a, a vital role in this dialogue. But Gareth's question uh, is, is really, I think quite uh, apposite for those of you who work in think tanks especially. And he says, what's the value or the value added potential of second track institutions, um, especially the Australia India Institute, uh, which is just uh, appointed former Senator Lisa Singh as its new head. And that is a great appointment, I would say. I'd note, of course, that the ANU is another great second track institution, but what is the value of second track institutions in building the, the relationship? Uh, and then finally, we go to Cosmo Jones, who's a student at ANU, and Cosmo asks, other than engagement for the sake of engagement, what does the panel think should be the specific long-term strategic goals of the Quad? And he notes especially what's the potential on the economic or geoeconomic side. So there's your smorgasbord. I'll go to you uh, one at a time for answers to one or more of those questions and perhaps any final observations you'd like to make, uh, Ritika. Hi. Um, all right, these are excellent questions and I'm going to very, very briefly just respond to two of them. Um, the first on value-based foreign policy. Um, I think, yes, there is a danger of falling into rhetoric more than pragmatic delivery on the ground. Having said that, I think it is an important part of 
delivery of, of any foreign policy, any country's foreign policy, just as the US emphasizes the importance of democracies working together, especially you know, in the larger context, yes, of the US-China uh, strategic rivalry. I think we all understand the little bit of conceit that's embedded within, um, uh, within such proclamations. Um, uh, at the same time, there can also be a positive value addition um, particularly in defining what contributions countries are seeking to make in their engagements. And I think for India, it is showcased exemplarily, or um, an exemplary case in point is effectively India's bid for a consultative um, collective response to developmental challenges for itself in its region with its neighborhood. And its emphasis, for example, on demand centric uh, development partnership. India is not without its own value based propositions in its uh, uh, foreign policy delivery. And the important thing I think to notice here is that um, instead of uh, a narrower definition of what comprises a democracy and what doesn't, given the domestic tensions we're witnessing, not only in India, but also in several countries in the, the European Union, also in the US, I think the broader, um, what, on the debate of values, I think the broader, um, the way that I look at it is these, can be principles of engagement, whether they relate to, for example, the need for transparent economic engagement, respect for sovereignty, striving to create free and open global commons, freedom of nav navigation. These necessarily do not translate into um, uh, the same uh, alignments on specific issues, but I think that broader rubric definitely cars out the positive contributions that these uh, that, that, that um, India and like-minded countries are seeking to play. Yes, this must be accompanied by delivery, but there is a value here to basing um, to describing these these principles of engagement. Um, uh, the second question that I wanted to very briefly answer was with respect to the quad. And I think here I'm actually going to uh, continue uh, use my previous answer as a springboard for this. The quad has to be a has to have a positive contribution longer term. No one can deny that there is a greater bilateral, trilateral, and of course, within the quad format, uh, increased military engagement, uh, trust, and greater uh, drive towards operate uh, uh, towards military operationalize, um, operationalization among the armed forces of these 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 countries. But at the same time, this should not. Um, it would be a very narrow lens through which to view the utility of the Quad, particularly given the fact that the Quad has firmly founded its footing beyond just a security role. Its uh, engagement, the three working groups that is instituted, whether it is for um, high tech, whether it is on climate change, or whether it is to meet the more immediate need of uh, providing vaccines to South Asia, and these are positive contributions that the Quad can make. Um, we're still waiting for steps to be taken on the vaccine manufacturing, for example, but delays in such positive contributions that are not necessarily always um, uh, strictly uh, security based, but I think in showcasing that engagement can exist under the parameters of ensuring a free and open navigation in the Indo-Pacific, I think that should be the, the, the focus of, of, of the quad uh, down the road. Thank you very much uh, for, for that contribution. That's um, the, the, there's a lot there, and I think the, the the broad vision of the quad is something that we'll all take away from that. And I'd note to Tino and um, Harinda, there was a second half to Gareth Evans' question there that I uh, I left out, which was not only what should the role of these track to institutions be, but in particular uh, on what agenda, which issues, whether it's soft security, hard security, economics, technology. So any any more um, precision you can give to that would be great. Um, but Tino, over to you. Thank you, Rory. Three, three points trying to address the whole variety of great questions to Natasha's. I think uh, um, to build on what Hirinder had shared before, uh, I think we would have a very um, limited perspective of what's happening around the world. And in particular, between India and Australia, if you just look at the China factor as a single cause of partnerships. And similarly, if we look at democracy as a single driver of these relationships, it's neither or, it's both. And there's, it's many more things. Economics too. Let's not forget India is a growing economy that was not 
know, half the size 10, 20 years ago. So this is, there are many, many factors at play. And therefore, I would refrain from calling these values-based relationships. These are values-facilitated relationships or values-shaped um, relationships. Because if it was really values-driven, we would have had an India allying with Western Europe, with NATO, with the US, with Australia 40, 50 years ago, which was not the case when India was pretty much proto-allied with the Soviet Union. So, and I think that holds for everyone, right? The imperative of strategic, rational interests uh, come first. But the point I've made in my opening statement today was that values make it easy. They're the glue that brings the building blocks together in a more sustainable way. And I think India and Australia show that. The breadth of diverse relationships you have today between Indian and Australian institutions, now going to the second question, uh, is phenomenal. And I think a lot of credit goes to Harinder, to Peter Verghese, to you, Rory, to many others on the Indian side too, uh, several Indian high commissioners in Canberra, that over the last, I'd say, you know, five to 10 years have really revolutionized this relationship. And that's something that does not work today between India and China. That's something that is not featured in the India-Russia relationship, which is an excellent relationship, but does not have that strong civil society dimension, which is a reflection of true pluralist democratic societies and governments that recognize that as an asset to the future of the relationship. So just as a response to I think many democratic partners that have reasons to be concerned about some things in India. In fact, Indian government recognizes there's a lot of challenges in India. It's the first, I mean, one to come out and say, yeah, there are a lot of problems we're facing with institutions, with managing 1,400 people's expectations, ambitions, different ideological agendas, et cetera, 29 states, 30 states. I think that that's, that's all obvious, but it's up to these other democratic partners to choose whether they want to take on this sort of moral mantle of superiority and monitor control and say, you know, India should be doing better on this. You must do better on or if you want to have a productive engagement agenda with a fellow democracy, with an exceptional democracy in the developing world, it's not just another Western democracy, but at the heart of Asia, uh, and it offers a very distinct, better or not, time will tell, but a distinct model from the Chinese one. Just to finalize on the quad, uh, Rory, I've made this recently in my piece, an argument that some people sort of, I think, may have different views on, but I, I this is something I feel very strongly about, is that, if you look at the countries in Southeast Asia and South Asia and the Indian Ocean region, the last thing they want is a joint military exercise from the Quad in their waters, nearby their waters with them. Sometimes they may be okay with it, it increases their bargaining power with China. But the first thing they want is concrete financial, developmental, economic solutions to strengthen their modernization paths. So that's where the Quad's agenda, I'd say 2.0 agenda of the last year of civilianizing the Quad, I think that Kritik has mentioned towards critical supply chains, tech, vaccine diplomacy, capacity building, connectivity that is truly free and open. That is where the solution for the Quad lies in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you, Tino. Last word to you, Harinda, and um, I am going to change my instructions and request that you do, among other things, answer uh, the question about uh, Track 2 activity. Good, because I was actually going to answer that question. Um, so uh, and it's interesting that Gareth asked it because I reckon he's got the answer already. Um, look, uh, it, I think it's absolutely essential. It has actually, it's the Track 2 activity is actually been what we, has got us here. I think the track do activity that certainly you led, um, Rory, uh, I know I worked with you, Tino, on this when I was there and even pre before I got there. That's what has opened the conversation and built the trust in the system and both systems about us. It has allowed us the scope to explore where we can actually have areas of commonality. I think the track two dialogues that we established also were the first to pick up in those areas where um, there was potential to take the relationship forward. Most significantly, Gareth asked about the Australia India Institute. People do forget a little bit, but when we were accelerating on the SICA negotiations in 2014 and 2015, the Australia India Institute facilitated a lot of dialogue at the working level uh, to explore areas of common interest and actually did support that process. So there, there is, I don't think there's a specific area where you would actually bring the track two in, but you, uh, 
if you just had a bilateral relationship that was led entirely at the government to government level, it's not really a relationship. It really has to happen at multiple levels. And in fact, it is when you see that flourishing of the alternative forms of dialogue, of engagement, of working together in multiple areas, that's when you know you've really got a relationship going. So I'll just leave it there. I'm conscious we're short on time. Look, thanks, Harinda. And I think I'll, there's, there's, there's not a lot of wrapping up for me to do. I mean, this has been a very energising conversation. And, you know, I think at a time where uh, the world is a place of such great uh, uncertainty or worse, I think disruption, uh, you know, there, there is damage to credibility of, um, of institutions. There's, there's so much to be anxious about. At the same time, um, you know, I, I do like to look at India through uh, a lens of some confidence. At times, uh, that gets shaken, but I think it's conversations like this that remind us of some of those fundamental qualities uh, about what makes India uh, not only special, but what makes India, I think, such an important part of not just the geopolitical story, but the human story uh, in this century. So I want to thank our three participants um, and sort of note in passing to the observers, to the other participants in the event today uh, that we'll share through the uh, Secretariat uh, some readings and documents. I especially want to share the opinion polls that we've spoken about today because they really do, I think, open our eyes as to what young India thinks. Um, on that note, I'm going to wrap us up uh, a minute or two early so that we can prepare for the next session in this uh, really fast moving feast. I also want to, uh, again, uh, thank uh, not only our participants, but also encourage everyone to tune in for the Indian External Affairs Minister uh, for the Crawford oration this evening. Uh, it's a significant achievement for the university uh, that uh, Joe Shankar has agreed to do this one. He's probably quite a busy man, I suspect, um, but it's also, I think, an important signal about the Australia-India relationship. So thank you again. And on that note, I'm going to um, say goodbye and ask you all to join me in thanking our panellists. <laughs>